What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Rams Brothers. I'm your host, Dean, and I'm joined, as always, by my brother and the other fantastic host of this show, Nick. And Nick, uh, we're what, two days into padded practice? Maybe we're on day three of padded practice, training camps underway. But first and most importantly, how are you, my good brother? I'm good. Uh, I heard today that the Super Bowl, for the first time ever, is going to be shown simultaneously on Nickelodeon. Ah, hence so, your Nickelodeon Broncos versus Rams t-shirt. Completely coincidental, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, very comfortable shirt that I used to go to the gym today that somebody complimented me on. And they were like, are you a Rams fan or a Broncos fan? And I really just wanted to say neither. Let me finish my workout. But I said <laughs> Rams fan. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious if any fans at camp are repping the uh, the SpongeBob and Patrick Bronco and Rams Nickelodeon t-shirt. I'd imagine not, but if you want to find that t-shirt, the one that Nick is wearing specifically, go to homage.com and they have all of your Nickelodeon needs on homage. Uh, yeah, so the game, the Super Bowl will be cast on Nickelodeon. Breaking, breaking news, so interesting. Uh, I'm sure there will be some people that will watch that and some others that completely ignore it. But as we're in the training camp, Everything's kind of starting to heat up a little bit. I think there's some really, really good conversations that are stemming around some position battles. We were working with upwards of, what, 37, 38 rookies at this point that are in the building that are still trying to compete for a starting role. They're still trying to earn the credibility of Sean McVay, of Aubrey Pleasant, uh, of Eric Henderson, of whomever the position coach may be when that player is specifically trying to earn a role. So that's kind of the narrative of, of the offseason right now is how many of these guys can compete? How many of these new faces are going to emerge as starters? And what's going to be the final you know, depth chart battle? What's, how's the, the, the bottom half of the depth chart going to shake out with all of these new faces in the building? So I think you can go offense, defense, special teams. Obviously, special teams is entirely brand new. But as we were kind of just chatting back and forth, Nick, and as we were making the conversation on Twitter, is how many net new faces are you actually going to see on the starting rotation on Sundays. And it, you know, when you're looking at May, you're looking at June, you're talking about a retool, rebuild, whatever the way that you want to frame uh, the direction of this off season, you know, there was a little bit of panic that seeped in and you think to yourself, what would have happened if Aaron Donald, Cooper Cup and Matthew Stafford were all shipped off to a new team, you would have none of this excitement. You would have none of these, these uh, detailed position battles. You would have none of these off season conversations that, would have any type of encouragement. You would be starting fresh from the beginning and, and uh, you know, not a lot of encouragement. So Yeah, I, I will say this, just based on the insider information that you and I are receiving and Ram social media, I've seen a lot of offensive highlights, which leads me to believe that the defense could be getting <laughs> cooked. Like, like just really, really getting – blown up if Stenson Bennett is out there throwing dimes uh our QB2 is looking is looking grand um, well it's, Stenson, it's so it's so funny because you'll hear the complete opposite from Sean McVay immediately when he steps upon the podium he says that the offense looks sloppy even if it's if it's as simple as the cadence coming out of the huddle making sure to get the play call right operating well out of structure which is apparently Stenson Bennett's preference because when you don't necessarily know the scheme and you don't have the playbook memorized verbatim then a lot of good things can happen out of structure for a young quarterback. And like, these are all the kind of conversations that you're excited about is the fact that the offense is there's a ton of highlights. There's a battle for the third wide receiver position with Cooper cup and Van Jefferson locked in cam Akers Looks like he added 45 pounds of muscle. Uh, you know, you have Tyler Higby and Andre long and the Bryson Hopkins conversation at tight end with Tyler Higby on his way out next year. But a lot of these faces are still, very much the same in terms of what we've seen. I think across the offensive line and the third receiver uh, position battle are going to be the most interesting. You talk about the left tackle. You could talk about the right guard, whether it's Alaric Jackson versus Joe Nopum or Coleman Shelton versus Logan Bruss versus Tremaine Ingram. Like there are so many angles to, uh, to, to how you can kind of build this up week to week. But I think that um, that's where it's going to get really interesting. And that's why I feel like the conversations are still – as interesting as they are and as much fun as they are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like the convers like two years ago, the conversations were completely different. You know, it, it wasn't like who's gonna make the team. It yeah. was how are the top guys operating, how is the 
you know, relationship building with Stafford and the wide receivers and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah you know, it's a, we're kind of in the same era. It's also just really fun because everybody can speculate all they want. Nobody has any idea where any of these, like, 32 teams are going to go. We can all agree that, that the new sideline hats look horrible for every team. But I think that's the only thing that we can agree on. Um, I mean, also, let's – I I think we should start just getting right into the running backs because this – you talked about bulky Cam Akers. This is something that is kind of in the forefront of my mind. So we signed Sony Michelle. Great, you know. And then, like, three days later, maybe it was too hot in California – and he retired. He was like, I'm done. Uh, so then they get Royce Freeman, apparently, as his replacement, who I had to Quickly, look up. Within yeah. 24 hours after the fact. Who I had to really look up, honestly, because it was not a name I was familiar with. And I was just like, Henderson is out there visiting um, the Patriots. I don't even think they picked him up yet. Like, he was totally available. So to me, that seemed like the obvious choice. Bring him back on like a you know just like a team friendly deal, if he wanted to come back. But mm-hmm. then they get Royce Freeman. So I wonder if the Daryl Henderson conversation they moved away because there was so much conflict with Cam Akers in last season. You know I don't know what happened in that running back room. If Daryl Henderson was finally the the straw that broke the the camel's back, if he was the one that said something specifically to Sean McVay that was direct, that was out of line, that was offensive in place of Cam Akers because he had been getting so much verbal abuse and because they had expected so much out of him. And I guess the two of them at that time, in that point in time in training camp last year. So I don't know exactly what happened. We don't know exactly what happens in the Rams' running back room as example of Todd Gurley and Daryl Henderson and all the players that have have exited um, in recent years. So, I mean, the Cam Akers discussion is really interesting because he has bulked up, and this is what we're talking about in terms of Cam Akers putting on, what, 30, 35 pounds of muscle. He looks like he could take on uh, a full load. He looks like he could take on 25 carries a game. He looks like he could be an elite pass catcher out of the backfield, which is the direction of the running backs right now, which maybe that's you know something that Daryl Henderson wasn't necessarily able to offer. But then, Nick, you go back to the Super Bowl and the catch he made – um, and and that's exactly what it is that he could. Took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. Right. Exactly right. So you can kind of go back and forth with the direction of the running back, how much you're expecting of Cam Akers, Sonny Michelle retiring, replacing him directly with Royce Freeman, who I assume they had a relationship with prior, and it it seems like it's a revolving door for that fourth or fifth position, whether it's Jake Funk, whether it's Sonny Michelle, whether it's Royce Freeman, whomever it may be that's towards the bottom of that depth chart. Yeah, and I bet – I mean, Sonny was more of like a blocker slash bowling ball kind of guy. Entirely, between the tackles, yep. Yeah, so I I would assume that's that's what they were looking for exactly. So hopefully Royce can just fill, fill that role and then let Cam just be the ultimate playmaker. And maybe, you know, maybe there's a little less drama between the two now now that the roles can be like 100% established. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because at least from a fantasy perspective, which I know everybody's thinking about right now and where Cam Akers will sit, um, you know, the Rams would just lean more towards Sony in the red zone because they get down the one or two yard line. He would just push it in and Cam wouldn't really have that many touchdowns. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, I mean, Sony Michelle, though, I think Cam Akers and Sony Michelle both came off of back to back years in 2000 and 2001, where they had outrageously successful Decembers. And that's really how you remember Sony Michelle's the last, you know, what, five, six games of the season in 2021, as he kind of led us back into the playoffs as Cam Akers was getting back healthy and then made his debut against the, um, the Buccaneers in the divisional round. So, or what was it in the round prior against the Cardinals? Either way, that's the situation that you put yourself in um, when you're kind of splitting hairs and carries. And I, I just feel like that they're going to try and give Cam Akers the workload that he's asking for, that he's physically demanding based on the way his, his body looks and the shape that he's in. So I just I would like to see a lead back featured in this offense, similar to what we saw with Todd Gurley, with some you know new outlets, new schemes, new things to get Cam Akers around the edge to get him in space. I think it could lead to a successful offense. Yeah. I mean, that's what, you know, that's what worked so well in, with 2018. That's was one of the, you know, why the Sean McVay offense was so incredible, you know? You and it's that, not even that you have to be, 
it's not, yeah, it's not even that you have to be the most successful team in terms of running the ball. It's just that you have to marry the concepts together in terms of the pass and run so that everything looks the same. It's yeah. the, the, um, the mirage of conception, whatever McVay likes to call it, right? It's, it's illusion that, of complexity, the illusion of complexity. Thank you. When you, you're combining those looks, you put Cooper cup in the backfield, you split cam makers out wide, you use 11 personnel, even when you're in empty, or you still have three receivers, a tight end and a running back on the field in that scenario. There's whether it's the same personnel grouping, whether it's the same concepts, the same schemes, those are the kind of things that you have to be able to introduce to the offense with. It could be death by a thousand paper cuts in one series, and it can be explosive in the next. So I think that's kind of some of the methodologies that you want to be able to instill. Royce Freeman's the kind of guy that can pick up short yardage, but Cam Akers is going to be your explosive back. You have similar features within your skill players outside. Um, and so much depth at the receiver position right now, you're fearful that Lance McCutcheon is going to be the odd man out. So I think you're a little more fearful of – Somebody else being the odd man out. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I know what you're alluding to, and there is a 0% chance that Ben Skronik is not on the roster this year. Damn. Zero. Yeah. Unfortunately for many Rams fans, oddly enough. No, uh, I think I think, I think people have come around now. Based he on – like, He was a highlight of last year. Yeah, but he's a versatile, and I'm going to go into why I, I like him to potentially win the third position, third receiver position. But, I mean, like that, that kind of versatility, I think that's what you need. And, I mean, you're looking at the bottom tier of the receiver group. Tyler Johnson is potentially the seventh guy, potentially the sixth guy, and then right below him is Lance McCutcheon. It sounds like Demarcus Robinson is doing everything necessary to be able to earn his spot uh, on this roster. And then the third receiver position seems like it's a battle between Tutu Adwell Ben Skoranek and Puka Nakua. So, Nick, I just want you to stop and ask yourself, and I want all Rams fans to stop and ask themselves, if every player was drafted in the exact same spot and we're all getting paid the exact same amount of money and there were no necessary expectations on each player based on where they were drafted, who would you choose? Who shows the most, most versatility? Who's the most willing downfield blocker in both phases, both the run and pass game? Who understands the offense inside out when they're asleep? That's going to be the guy that earns the spot and earns the snaps. Ben skronik has been around. Tutu Atwell's been around. I too, too. Seems I think like I he's the most versatile, Tutu probably Atwell. has the most to offer as a receiver. But yeah, the ceiling is higher for Tutu Atwell than it is Ben Skronik. Sure. That's in, that's in my certain scenarios. Yeah. And, you know, in like big play, like explosion play. You could argue Skronik is better, you know, every single down, but you know, like for like big play moments, I'm gonna I'm gonna lean towards two two, and you know, for like a wide receiver three, they got to be a little more like Skronik and Cup are very similar at what they do, so that's why the whole Cooks, uh, Cup and Woods was such a you know was so magnificent because each one kind of brought something a little different to the table, um, so yeah, hopefully. Two, yeah, two, true. Kind of fill that role. It's, it's true. Cooper Cup and Ben Skronik and both play the X, Y, and F. That's that's the feature of that receiver is and the versatility that those type of receivers offer. They're bigger bodied. They can run in the slot. They're a matchup nightmare. They can get down in the backfield. And I, I think that's a little bit different from some of the versatility that you want to be able to offer from the third receiver position, right? Like somebody like Brandon Cooks, right? You try to replace that position with somebody like Tutu Atwell. So from an 11 personnel perspective and having three receivers on the field, that type of tempo, that type of momentum can really create explosives. I think the issue that it creates when you have three players in that third receiver spot is just the constant rotation, right? And it's how many different looks can you roll out in the same series? But if you're gonna go with the method of death by a thousand paper cuts in one specific series, that could be your opportunity to roll out 11 personnel, 11 personnel, 11 personnel, one look being Ben Skoranek in the backfield, one look being two, two out while split wide, running as fast as you can down the field. So there's a lot of different options that I feel like they can bring in. And it's all just kind of merging everything that they brought to the table over the last five, six years. Yeah. hundred percent agree. It should be really, really fun. I'm, I'm telling you, I've said this like for the last three podcasts, I'm going to say it again, this will be the most fun preseason NFL Rams football that we've seen totally. in a really, really long time. Because every like all these guys are going to be playing for so much more than just preseason. 
The highlights last year were Bryce Perkins, John Wolford, and Lance McCutcheon. Do you remember any others? No. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, like two of two of those huge highlights ended up playing with QB two and QB three, and both of them were so bad that they had to make a hotline phone call to Baker Mayfield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then before we jump off of the third receiver position, I just want to talk about Van Jefferson for a second. Van Jefferson, what are your thoughts on him this year? Are you confident in him being a durable second receiver? Are you durable in him taking away targets from Cooper cup and keeping Cooper on the field? Uh, I just, in terms of durability, like he's missed two camps already, or he's missed two practices already within training camp. He was on a week-to-week -week injury designation last year that took him into the season and then led to surgery. So I think there's just some massive concern, at least in my eyes, that Van Jefferson is not going to be the player that we want him to be in his fourth and final season with the Rams. <laughs> fourth and final. Um, I Yeah, no. Th this is it. Like, this is the finale. So it's like if he's not going to bring it now, he's never going to bring it. Exactly. Uh, I also don't want to see Cup. 2-2 Skronik. I like I really don't want to see that as our three wide receivers this year because yeah, yeah. the yeah. same thing is going to happen where it's just going to get cup heavy. Stafford's going to only going to be able to throw it to him. He's the only guy that he's going to be able to trust. I mean, hopefully not. But like I'm just getting flashbacks of last year when it was like, oh my God, all we have is Cooper Cup. And guess what? He got injured. And now we like literally are playing for nothing. And in like yeah. seven. Yeah. And that's what you're oh, trying to prevent though. Right. With guys like Demarcus Robinson and Tyler Johnson, because then there's not going to be a situation with both of those guys on the roster where you're going to see Cooper Cup to do out on Ben Skronik. Yeah. But you're totally right, because that is a flashback to some of the worst memories we've had as Rams fans within this era. Like it didn't really make me that upset during the season last year because we were still champs, at least until the very end. But I, I feel it now more than ever. And like, you always feel this way in August where you're like, can we just get to September? And like, yeah. let's just, let, let's just have football. Summer's over. Um, but this whole off season has been like exceptionally grueling because I'm craving for like, you know, competitive football from my favorite team. And we well, haven't really had that. It's in quite been the time. exceptionally longer it's been yeah. two months longer than the previous uh off season was as well so and maybe i'm as i'm saying that i felt a little entitled because there have been lots of times in our lives where the rams have ha had shown nothing like no signs of life like for like you know copious amounts of seasons and we'd still watch them all the time but oh my god yeah. i remember the season i was a freshman in college i was sitting in my dorm and the rams had traded for brandon lloyd i think they traded a fourth or fifth round pick to acquire him and to me that that was the most exciting thing i had seen in five or six years was the acquisition of a receiver who was in his ninth or tenth season that had almost nothing else to offer i think he caught a top couple of touchdowns from sam bradford but that was the peak amount of my excitement over a six-year span i was going to say the uh, Danny Amendola seasons, he was like always my favorite part of that because I could always count on him doing something cool. Yeah, but I mean the last, uh, you know, 14, 15 seasons within St. Louis and then the first season at Los in Los Angeles was almost a complete nightmare. So to say that, you know, it's a difficult offseason, to me, I feel like we're just having a lot of fun with it, right? There's And if they would have traded away one of those or two of those weight-bearing walls in Stafford or Cup or Donald, None of that excitement would be there, in my opinion, because you yeah. don't have the players that are supposed to be well, modeling the way, leading the way. Like I mean, you can't even instill that that methodology and thought process and print it on the back of a T-shirt without those guys there. Big picture, let's say the Stafford deal doesn't go through. You you have a you would still have like a like a pretty good core with with how young Goff is in yeah, his, yeah. you know, like during his career, but you might not have a Super Bowl ring. So, right. you know, who knows, who knows? It really, yeah, I mean, imagine you're in this situation with Jared instead of Matthew and you've yeah. never gotten past the NFC championship game. I think there's a little bit of concern seeping in to the fact that we may never get there. And that's the yeah. most important part about, you know, being able to get over the top. Yeah. We could be the Packers for the last, yeah, like, you, you could years. be, you know, it's, all of a sudden, it's 12, 13 years before you return, and then you're stuck with Jordan Love, who actually looks like he's shown out a little bit in camp. But then I want to move over to the offensive line. 
They could win like four games this year. And I, was <laughs> I saw a couple of highlights and that's it. Um, the offense line... looks great in camp, except Dak for some reason. <laughs> Prescott is the only one who's thrown interceptions, which is one more crazy. Person that's the only one that I saw. Everybody hates the Cowboys. It's a great question. Somebody asked me point blank, who would you rather have Stafford at this age or Dak Prescott at this age? My answer will be a hundred percent of the time, Matthew Stafford, future hall of fame quarterback. Um, okay. Offensive line. Wait, wait, wait. So Stafford right now and Dak right now? Mm-hmm. Ooh. Dak, by the way, just turned 30. I think Stafford's you get so 35. much more. You get like seven. Think about like think about like you're buying a car. You're getting so seven much years, more mileage. Seven years of purgatory the- or another chance at Super Bowl glory. Yeah. I guess Stafford's got like three, four years left, right? Indeed. Hopefully. I mean, he's entering his 14th, 15th season in the NFL, so hopefully there's a couple of more years left. I'd well, still Rogers take the opportunity like chance. Right now, so. Doesn't look like he's old. He said he feels as healthy as he's ever felt. Uh, he looks fantastic. Got a brand new set of chompers. If you see him smile, he's got big white pearly teeth. Looks like really? Donald, got, Donald got him too, yeah. Um, so, yeah. and uh, I, saw, I saw Donald got him. But neither of them had bad teeth. Yeah. I feel like that's not a good call when you don't have bad teeth. When you have the money, you could do whatever you want. They both signed new contracts. They both won Super Bowls. Get yourself some new teeth. Why not? They look um, like um, like the like everybody after they got their Sopranos money, like all those like gangsters. Like I feel like there was a producer on the Sopranos that was like, "You can get your teeth done, but don't do it while we're while the season is going on." And then as soon as as soon as the show ended, I feel like they all got these like <laughs> like you know piercing white teeth. Uh, Look up Vito high. from Sopranos right now, and you're like, oh my god! I, you're entirely right. I just recently saw a picture of him, probably because our feeds are essentially the They're same the brain. Yeah, um, yeah. So th- I, I just wanted to talk about Steve Avila, and I wanted to talk about Joe Noboom, and I want to talk about Trayman Agram and Coleman Shelton and Logan Russ because. This, to me, it's obviously the offensive line has been a major point of emphasis, except for the fact in 2018 and 2021 where they nailed it entirely. And the, the entire so left left guard, left tackle, center, right guard, right tackle, it was a perfect, fluid poetry in motion. And I think that that's something that they're trying to get back. And especially with a new offense coordinator, a new offensive line coach in Eric Weddle, or Eric, um, Eric Weddle, I just said. Um, yeah. Eric Wendell, I should say, um, is carefully monitoring the fact that Alaric Jackson is the first person out there in camp every single day at practice. And he's battling up against the left tackle who what, signed a $43 million contract a couple of years ago, a uh, player that is coming off of a major injury and an Achilles surgery, um, and a player that seems like he still has a lot to prove in the NFL, and Joe Nupum. Alaric Jackson was – one of the highlights of the season last year. I feel like there was a game he came in mid-season. The Rams were the Rams were what two and four at one point of the season last year. They were two and two, then they went two and four, then I think they went down to like two and six, and then were three and six. And then Alaric Jackson came in and was filling in for an injury, and all of a sudden it was like a a major point of emphasis and a uh, something to highlight in a season just full of dreck. So. He's the guy to me that I feel like is going to earn that left tackle position. You yeah, can tell me it's going to be Joe Newcomb all along, but to me it's Allard Jackson. Allard Jackson is lining up halfway through the season. He looks to his left, and he sees a man who was just a cop in the streets of Marina Del Rey uh, <laughs> a couple days ago and is like, what the hell is going on here? And stepped up and played incredibly. And I'd like, you know, money be damned. I think he's, he's better for – for that spot then no boom and then you know you move it down and it's like allen versus shelton at center i mean yeah. where do you lean there i lean brian allen because i want coleman shelton to play right guard mm. because i don't believe in logan bruss yet because i haven't heard one positive thing about logan bruss since andrew whitworth said that he is on the right track at this point last year and then the injury happened. I think it was like three or four weeks later. It was the first week of the preseason, maybe not even two weeks later. And he was out for the season before we even knew it. So I that just I don't almost, know if he is like, ready to go. If you look at, the, look at the Super Bowl roster and then you look at like the following season and like who's missed the most, 100% in retrospect, it's Whitworth. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. Like it's it's no question. It's Andrew Whitworth, and I would also argue it's Austin Corbett because yeah. Yeah. Logan Bruss like, was supposed to be a plug and play right guard that was supposed to replace Austin Corbett. But yeah, obviously Andrew Whitworth is is the biggest. You'd think it'd be player. like OBJ or Von Miller, and no, it's not. It's one hundred percent Whitworth. We go back to the conversations that we had this time last year when we tried to convince ourselves that Joe Noteboom would be plug and play because of what he did in games against Minnesota and what he did in that playoff run in 2020, 2021. And then there's what happens last year. And then there's, you know, you have Logan Bruss can be plug and play. You miss Austin Corbett, but not really, but you do. Um, signed a massive contract with the Panthers. That's that's what happens in this league. Yeah. He was uh, he was an unrestricted free yeah, he, he deserved that. And the Panthers could be fun this year. He did. I mean, yeah, Austin Corbett was a late round draft pick by the Browns. And I think the Rams traded a late round draft pick to get him and earned himself a, a brand new contract in his uh, in his third stint in the NFL. Very impressive. It's yeah. a guy that I won on my team in every single situation. Mm -hmm. um, Too bad there's no offensive lineman draft in fantasy. <laughs> everybody, takes a, everybody takes a left tackle. Shouldn't there be? I mean, if defense is, you know. No, no, not even a left tackle, just like how many sacks were let up and like you like get docked a point. I don't know. That could be fun. Yeah, it could be fun. I'm sure there, there's a variation of that in some form. There's of definitely form. leagues out there that do something like that. Yeah. No kickers, but but we but we draft offensive linemen. Honestly, I, I wouldn't blame anybody for doing that. I almost kept Justin Tucker as my keeper this year in fantasy. You should have. If I would have known, I would have – I'm the only person who only kept one keeper except the no, guard friend who – just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> it is the year to go receiver heavy in fantasy football. All right, moving over to the defense. Aaron Donald, does he look better than he did last year? Physically. Uh, to me, he does. A, to me, he picture? looks bigger and stronger. Do you have a Donald picture? Don't have a Donald picture ready. There's there's a picture of him from camp. And he's got he's got the helmet on with like the padding and like the white and the blue. And somebody commented, and they were like, "He looks like uh, Mario with the with the uh, Hammer Brother item." And as a Mario fan myself, I didn't really even know what the Hammer Brother item was. I had to look it up, and I saw it, and I was like, "That's exactly what he looks like. He looks just scary big, and like he's carrying just hammers." He, well, yeah, he carried that helmet around in that uh, that Bengals scrimmage that they had last year. He was swinging it at people. He, to nice. me, though, looks bigger, stronger. He's not coming off of a Super Bowl hangover. He is, you know, not necessarily in the spotlight anymore. Feels like he has a lot to prove. He has a fourth Defensive Player of the Year award potentially um, on the horizon if he feels like that's capable and within reach. And if the Rams as a team holistically are good enough, and to me, that puts him in elite company. It puts him in one of one. Aaron Donald, only defensive player ever to win four defensive players of the year. And then he's on a quest for his second ring, which the Rams could be in tension for for next year if all things go accordingly. So to me, the fact that he's that guy, the fact that he's able to be in the building, he's able to teach guys like Kobe Turner. He's able to give more lessons to guys like Jonah Williams and Marquise Copeland, who are still coming along in their development, but have been on the roster for a longer period of time. And then all of the other rookies, like you got, you're getting help from, Aaron Donald, if you're a guy like Oshawan Mathis, if you're a guy like Bryce Young, like these edge rushers, like everybody's learning from Aaron Donald. And also I think the way that's, that they're setting him up in camp, in practice, preparing him for double, triple teams with Steve Avila, with, with Brian Allen, with Coleman Shelton, just making sure that all attention goes towards him because I don't know why nobody thought about this before, but you got to practice what you're, you're experiencing in games and, Finally, somebody came to the table with the idea and said, let's double team Aaron Donald for an entire day of practice and get him used to what he's used to. In games. I know. Like, why are why were they not doing that? Already? I'm not sure. Well, I, like, I mean, it tires the hell out of the player. That's oh, also well, incredibly yeah. Do you ever see the Devin Booker clip where he's getting double teamed in uh, United States? I think it's a USA basketball practice and Kevin Durant goes over to double team him or somebody else goes and he's screaming, no double teams, not double team in practice. Like, that's what players do not like. They want to be able to work on their think, technique, their skill set, you know, get everything grounded, get the uh, the playbook correct so that they know. So exactly that's probably Donald think. being like, I don't, don't know. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, I, like, I'm not taking a double team today at practice. Like, but he practice. also knows that it's going to help out his offensive line, which no, he knows is going to help protect his quarterback. 
That's true. Maybe and that's he why. knows that that's going to get yeah. him to the promised land again. That could be why he's doing it this year, where it's like, let's see what these guys can do to a, stop a behemoth like myself. <laughs> iron chop, sharpens iron. I think like the Garrett Wilson and Sauce Gardner battle that you're going to see in, uh, in, in Hard Knocks in a couple of days, it's a great example of things that we're looking at. It's You have the luxury. When does Hard Knocks drop? August 8th. Yeah, so you'll watch the Jets on Thursday night football in the Hall of Fame game. You'll watch Zach Wilson start against the Browns, I believe it is. And then five days later, you'll watch Aaron Rodgers on Hard Knocks with Garrett Wilson and, and Sauce Gardner. Get this for me next week. Listen to this. Monday night, SoFi, the 7th, Taylor Swift. Then Tuesday, Hard Knocks, Aaron Rodgers, Jets. Wednesday, Shohei Otani, Pitching. That sounds like a great great week of sports considering it's August. Yeah, Taylor Swift kind of counts as my football for that because it's in so far. Yeah, I'm sure there will be a couple of Rams players there, I imagine. Um, so, I mean, you're looking at, at Aaron Donald. The Super Bowl hangover is over. I think the defensive backs are all extremely interesting. One of them could be Taylor Swift's uh, next boyfriend. You never know. If maybe they want to give them a, a give her a friendship bracelet, similar to the way Travis Kelsey did. Yeah, move over Travis Kelsey. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like Travis would be the best bet for that that set up, but who knows? Some of the younger cornerbacks, I mean, Kobe Durant looks like he's going to be a star. Maybe that's somebody to do a, you know, to get a follow from early on. Uh, Trey Tomlinson, right? We're while everybody's watching Trey Tomlinson. Where is he going to play? Is he going to fit into the defense? Is he going to be a starter? Jordan Fuller's coming back for his fourth year. Akella Witherspoon who's playing with the club who just got thumb surgery, um, but looks like he could be penciled in as a starter right now. There's Jason Taylor versus Russ Yeast in the starting position that replaced Nick Scott. And then there's Robert Rochelle versus Darion Kendrick. Or is that role going to be fully owned by Akella Witherspoon? Like who's going to be able to cover some of the bigger bodied receivers downfield and man coverage. And just look within our division, Nick, you look at guys like DK Metcalf, you look at guys like Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel, you know, I don't even know who's a receiver on the Arizona Cardinals any longer because there's no DeAndre Hopkins and no AJ green. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of the situation that you face yourself with is you want to have some bigger bodied corners. The Kobe Durant's six foot, but he's a guy that they have penciled in to potentially play the star. Um, so you want two bigger body corners potentially on the outside, whether it's Darion Kendrick, Kella Witherspoon or Robert Rochelle. Um, so that battle is going to be consistently interesting. Like if you look at the way that uh, the defensive backs are aligned right now, you can go Russ East or Jason Taylor at the top with Jordan Fuller as starting safeties. And then you go Witherspoon and Kendrick on the outside and, and Durant in the slot of the star. And then you just kind of kind of figure out a creative way, whether that's going into a dime from a nickel with getting six cornerbacks on the field in Trey Tomlinson, or you go with a hybrid, right? Because that Sam linebacker position opposite of, of Ernest Jones is, is net new this year, right? Like there's going to be a new face in that role. It's going to be, it could, it could be Rose boom. It could be, you know, another safety that they want to put in that same position opposite of Ernest Jones is going to be the Mike. So I think you're going to see a lot of really interesting rotations amongst that class. And the fact that, Aubrey Pleasant is back. The Kobe Durant was so happy to talk about Aubrey, Aubrey Pleasant that it actually enticed a reporter to ask him about his teeth and why they're so white because he couldn't <laughs> stop smiling about the introduction and our reintroduction, I should say, of Aubrey Pleasant. So, yeah, that's they're going to be a young, fiery group. We talk about like return yards on reset on interceptions. The Kobe Durant led the league last year. Um, Darion Kendrick is battling a hamstring injury, but. Raheem Morris is talking about how he showed a lot of promise recently. I'm, I'm confident in that secondary. For right. the best case scenario, they're bringing some to the table of like the Jets either like, like kind of like two years ago, like before they were like really like, you know, fully grown to where they were, yeah. where they were all like very young and hungry. And then worst case scenario, you're putting out guys out there that are, you know, letting up a lot of points. You're clearly missing Jalen Ramsey. Um, but you know, you still have Aaron Donald, so and you still have Raheem Morris. So I think at the end of the day, it's funny that McVeigh wants to compliment the offense more so, or like uh, you know, do the opposite, compliment the defense more than the offense. Because, you know, at least you take out Aaron Donald, this is not a group where people are going to really recognize. Any names on this depth chart at all? Unless, unless, right, you unless you're a Rams fan, right? Yeah, 
or 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 you're a Rams fan, right? I'm just saying, like the average person. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, because it's 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 really interesting the amount of net new faces you're going to see that were on the roster last year but weren't starters. I mean, you're going to Christian Christian Roseboom. I mean, there's potentially a Keller Witherspoon who they brought in as a free agent this past year. You're going to see somebody new in the safety position opposite of Jordan Fuller. But outside of that, the defense isn't going to look that much drastically different. Like, I, I feel like the development of Ernest Jones has has been expedited because Bobby Wagner is no longer in the building. I feel like he's ready to step up. I just don't feel like across the board there's a lack of continuity the way that the national media is painting the picture. Right. Like the offense is going to look very similar to what we saw last year when everybody was healthy. The defense is going to be missing a couple of pieces, but for the most part, a lot of the players are all in-house hires, right? They're all, they're all players that have been in the building that they've drafted, that they've groomed, that they want to be able to take to the next level. Um, so I just, yeah. And I guess when you think back to last year, it's more so the offense dropping the ball than the defense not yeah, really very much so. Yeah. yeah. Cuz I, I mean, mean defense I feel like took a lot of the brunt of it, right? I think statistically they were worse off because the offense was so bad. Right, right. Like like the Bucks game should have been won. Like like the last time they played Tom Brady, they should have absolutely dismantled them. The defense like gave up so few points and the offense couldn't score. First time they played the Niners, um, it's just funny because when I think back in the season, I'm like, oh, they were both really bad. But then I watched that Netflix quarterback show, and they bring up the Rams game. The Rams played a great defensive game against Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, they did. And the offense just with Bryce Hopkins, led by Bryce Hopkins, couldn't do anything. So, And I, I think that that was the game that Sean McVay didn't even call himself. I think that yeah, was the game that he said, Liam Cohn, you can, you can run the play call and duties for this, which is the only time that's ever happened in Sean McVay's career. As head coach, probably be the the last time. It will be. (laughs) They said that it very much will be. Yeah. So, you know, how do you you can't lose control of something? It's like losing creative control of the movie that you've written. Right. Could that could never happen? What a lot of writers do, at least the movies, television. The writers get all the all the power, but movies not so much. Actually, they have no power anymore. Not anymore. No. Final question. Does this unit have the power? And can you recognize any of these people? No. <laughs> I can't. All right. I'm going to take you from left to right because this is our new special teams unit. It's oh, Tanner God. Brown on the left as our kicker. Alex Ward, our long snapper in the middle, Mr. Personality. And then you have Ethan Evans as the punter. By the way, Ethan Evans, I confuse him as a starting quarterback in this league. I don't know about you, but he looks like he's a big guy. Yeah, those ears. He's got quarterback ears. Yeah, and then, you know, the uh, Alex Ward is, I believe he's from overseas. I want to say he's from Germany. I may have that incorrect. Rams fans from Germany, correct me if that's incorrect. Um, and then Tanner Brown, is that a guy that you look like you have a lot of confidence in? None of them. I have zero confidence. And special teams last year was bad. So I'll tell you what, I already miss Matt Gay. Yeah. Matt Gay signed the largest offseason contract for a kicker in the history of the NFL with Where the Indianapolis Colts. Colts. How could you compete with that? Yeah, he was the best. I mean, the Buccaneers essentially let him go and he went on to win a Super Bowl with the Rams. It was great. Yeah, got to take down the Buccaneers. In that division but, round, yeah. It's very and, simple. like, he was on – he was cut by the Bucs, and then the Rams picked him up, and then the Rams played the Bucs in 2020, and they and they beat them. Like, And that, he was like, yeah, that was, like, the best experience of my career. Like, yes, Matt Gay. Until the next one. Yeah. Until the divisional round. Yeah. Rams fans, that's all we got for you today. This has been a full training camp update of all of the moving pieces on our next episode. We're going to do a part two of our 53 man depth chart projection, um, which successful last time. I think we got some good responses, except for the fact that we couldn't pronounce Brett Rippon's name correctly, which we'll make sure to correct in the next. It was the names that were the bad responses, but (laughs) you know, it's not Google translate. It's not like, you know, everybody's getting like a perfect name spoken to us. 
We'll it do our is, best. That is the most difficult part of this offseason is remembering names, remembering faces. Players have to stand out. Players have to make a name for themselves. And players have to be able to find a way to get on Rams' social media to make a name for some of the younger generation fans. Um, a lot of fun. Always enjoy talking with you, Nick. Guys, if you're enjoying, like, subscribe, follow, and uh, we'll be around for the long haul. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Dean, I'll see you later. Go Rams. Peace. Go Rams.